Hi, everyone. Welcome to Going Disparate, Politics and Crime with Pam and Mara. Pam is taking a very well-deserved day off today, so it'll be just me with our guest today. We are joined by Michael Dorf. He is the Robert S. Stevens Professor of Law at Cornell Law School and a constitutional scholar. He's a regular contributor to the American Prospect and regularly quoted in the press. He's also the leading blogger of a really informative, insightful uh, blog on the law called Dorf on Law. Thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So the Supreme Court has just handed down a bunch of decisions, and there is I would describe sort of generalized anger and frustration on the left. Um, and I would like us to take this opportunity to clarify what some of the issues are in some of the leading cases and talk about maybe what we can do to address what I personally see um, as a badly broken Supreme Court. And actually, what I want my first question to you to be, given that you are a professor at Cornell Law School. What do you teach your students in this environment? Because part of my legal education was, was understanding that judges have a certain moral fiber. Maybe they may not be perfect, but they respect and understand and uphold the Constitution. They respect, understand, uphold precedent. What do you say to your students? So I think a lot of people come to law school with that view. Um, a lot of people who are of our generation and came of age when um, we still remembered the Warren Court and the Burger Court was still uh, preserving the core of the work of the Warren Court and only sort of uh, whittling away at the edges, mm -hmm. have a somewhat heroic view of the Supreme Court. Uh, mm -hmm. What I try to do with my students is to put this in historical context and point out that for most of US history, the US Supreme Court has been at best a neutral and at times a reactionary institution. Mm -hmm. And that's not really surprising if you think about how they're selected. If you think that there is over the long run, you know, to uh, paraphrase King, moral mm -hmm. progress, right, that the mm -hmm. arc of the moral universe bends towards justice, mm -hmm. then what you're going to see from institutions whose membership reflects earlier generations will be a kind of lag. And so mm -hmm. um, in the 19th century, the Supreme Court was defending the institution of slavery. In the first third of the 20th century, the Supreme Court was defending laissez-faire capitalism, even in the teeth of the Great Depression. It's really only for a brief period from the 1950s through the early 1970s that the Supreme Court was uh, sort of out front on liberal and progressive issues. And even then, it wasn't that far out front. Mm -hmm. uh, the court that uh, we remember from that period was generally good on free speech, but it didn't stand up to McCarthyism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Earl Warren wasn't yet on the Supreme Court, but he was governor of California in the episode that was memorialized in the Korematsu case. Uh, and so I think it's a mistake to turn judges and justices into heroes, and it's certainly a mistake to depend on them for political progress. That's a really wonderful, helpful answer. And to listeners, I'd say that's a really good example of what you'll find on his blog, which is one of the reasons that I really do rely on it. You wrote a piece for the Boston Globe in which, given all that, you still basically say that the Supreme Court is reflecting what I would, would refer to as um, the preferences of the Republican Party on a lot of issues, whether it's gun safety legislation or it's reproductive rights or it's race or it's campaign finance. It, they certainly give the appearance of doing what Republicans want them to do. And there are a bunch of reasons why that's really concerning. Yeah, that's and that's a relatively recent phenomenon. That is to say, 
it's only been in the last decade uh, since the retirement of justices uh, David Souter and John Paul Stevens mm -hmm. that the Supreme Court's partisan makeup has been exactly reflected in its ideological makeup. That is, we used to have liberal justices who were appointed by Republicans and fairly conservative justices who were appointed by Democrats. Yeah. We are now in an era, and we have been in such an era for roughly the last decade, when every Democratic appointee is more liberal than every Republican appointee. Mm -hmm. And because there are now six Republican appointees, that means this is a very conservative court, one that doesn't merely have uh, conservative jurisprudential ideas, right? That they're not merely committed to the notion of construing the Constitution according mm -hmm. to the original understanding, mm -hmm. things like that, but has uh, values that align very closely with what I would describe as the sort of core uh, Republican Party ideology. Well, see, and, and this is why it feels so problematic to me is that because of the disclosures on, you know, Thomas um, and um, Alito and, and other issues, you know, with Thomas's wife, with Roberts's wife, that there are financial interests at play there here uh, with folks who are doing financial favors for Supreme Court justices who are then deciding cases in ways that those givers of favors want them to. So, Whereas previously it might have seemed that there were principled conservatives. Frankly, Michael Dorff, these folks don't seem like principled conservatives to me. So let me push back against part, yes. of, part of that. Yeah. Um, with respect to the um, financial benefits that Justices Thomas and Alito seem to have received from their various sponsors. I agree that contrary to what Justice Alito wrote in the Wall Street Journal, it creates at least the appearance of impropriety. Um, I will say, uh, and this I suppose is damning with faint praise, that in defense of Justices Thomas and Alito, I think that their ideological druthers are so baked in at this point um, that if they were being bribed to vote uh, conservative, those that money was wasted because they were going to vote that way anyway. So that I don't really think the core problem here is corruption. I don't think corruption is a good thing. And I think that there is certainly an appearance and maybe the reality of impropriety here. But uh, I think the basic problem is that in the current political environment, the polarization that we see, and I really think it's asymmetrical polarization, that is to say the how far the Republican Party has moved to the right has bled into uh, the Supreme Court. Um, so that uh, that's with respect to what's motivating them. Uh, I also, but I agree with what you say about principled conservatives. I think occasionally they surprise us, they right? Do. That is, they that do. there was... Yep. Uh, the Voting, right, the Voting Rights, Rights Act yep. case, the, yep. this term was, although even then, of course, you know, this, that the very same Supreme Court uh, refused to um, to stay the lower court opinions that allowed uh, Alabama and other mm -hmm. states mm -hmm. uh, with the same issue that allowed those states to use the old maps. And that mm -hmm. was probably enough to swing uh, the House of Representatives to Republican control. So in a way, that was a little too little too late, although it will have an impact on yeah. future elections. Um, but there, but there, so there are there are cases in which the conservatives vote in a way that I think is counter to their pure ideology. Um, and they're and not really means, conservative. They're actually radicals. No. Well, uh, uh, no, I, 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 I guess, I guess I want to pull, push back against that too. That is, I, you know, I, I do want to praise them in the Alabama Voting Rights Act case. I also want to give them yeah. a little bit of credit uh, for what was potentially the the worst case of the term, which is more against Harper. Then that's mm -hmm. the case involving the North Carolina uh, congressional yeah. uh, gerrymander, uh, yeah. where the court rejected this crazy view pushed by Donald Trump's legal team, 
that a state legislature acting independently of the governor, the state Supreme Court can do anything it wants. Yeah, that was that was very scary. And I just I love your point about how these conservative uh, justices would have voted that way anyway. But I have a little pushback on that point, which is that we don't know everything about the extent to which they have been, to my mind, if not bribed, then influenced, indoctrinated. You know, how many, how many trips did they get where they hung out with people who had a certain view because they wanted them to adopt that view? So though I think you may be right, but I would like to know more before I completely agree with that. I think it's entirely possible that there has been a long indoctrination process. Um, I mean, the Federalist Society has been playing a long game for a long time. So I wonder. Yeah, so I, I think that the, I think it's that's perfectly fair. Uh, there is an incredible lack of transparency. Uh, the calls for applying the Judicial Code of Ethics to the Supreme Court are lo long overdue to be heeded. Uh, so, you know, at the very least, I certainly agree that uh, we need to know more and there should be stricter rules. Absolutely. Now, I would love to talk about all cases, but I would just want to focus on 303 Creative for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, that was, there was no live controversy, right? Which I was taught that the Supreme Court doesn't decide hypotheticals. This was... Right. So so let me, for the benefit of the listeners, right? so 303 yeah. Creative, this is the case from Colorado in which this uh, woman, Lori Smith, uh, has a website design business. And mm -hmm. she says that she would like to expand her existing business to start creating uh, wedding websites. This is, you know, the sort of website where you can click on, you find out information about the wedding, how the yeah. couple met. You can presumably there's their their registry where you can buy them a gift. Um, and um, but she hasn't started the business yet. She says she's afraid that if she goes into this business um, under Colorado's uh, public accommodations law, she will be required to serve same-sex couples on an equal basis with opposite-sex couples. And, and that, as would, you say, that would strike fear into the heart of anyone, would it not? No. Right. I'm well, sorry, she, I'm very yeah, annoyed she, by this case. <laughs> well, what's interesting is, so she's a uh, religious conservative Christian. She says this is inconsistent with her. And this is the interesting part, her free speech, right? The case gets litigated in the Supreme Court as a freedom of speech case. It's not a free exercise of religion case, right? So her claim is simply that producing one of these websites is a work of expression and it's her expression and she doesn't just chill from doing this. So there's a, there's a whole lot of steps you have to go through in order to even get to an issue here. Um, and you're right that it does seem quite hypothetical. Now, there is a route the Supreme Court takes to get there, right? That is, there are circumstances in which mm -hmm. one can sue before one has done anything. So think about, uh, suppose a uh, city has uh, rules restricting who can hold a parade um, mm -hmm. or a march, and you want to hold a parade or a march. Well, you might not want to hold your parade or march without getting a permit, Mm -hmm. and then get prosecuted and sent to prison, you might want to sue in advance, mm -hmm. right? And the mm -hmm. courts generally allow you to do that. Um, but there, it does seem more, as the court's cases say, imminent, right? We want to hold a march in thus and such a day. We think the standards for licensing it are unfair. So give us a license, you sue in advance. Here, it does seem uh, very hypothetical. And I'll add that I am at least a little bit dubious that this is a business that has any prospect of ever making any money. Because if you just go on to the internet, you'll find half a dozen or more right. websites right. that will design for you beautiful websites about that, you know, for your for your wedding for right. free. Um, and uh, but, so it does also, seem made up. But she also claimed that someone had contacted her who doesn't, who, who, who has now come forward and said, I never contacted her about a same sex marriage our same-sex wedding. And by the way, I'm married and it's 
a heterosexual marriage. So right. So yeah. So so that that aspect of the, the what we've learned in the last week is yeah. you know is galling. Although it, I don't think it um, further undercuts the uh, issue of standing. That is to say, nothing in the Supreme Court's opinion turned on whether anybody had contacted her or not. It does tend to undermine but, her and her lawyer's credibility. Well, yeah, but I mean, but, but but is there no recourse when someone? gets a case all the way to the United States Supreme Court based on a false filing, well, filing I, I of read, false information. So, I mean, so we don't we don't know that it was false. What I read um, was that her lawyer said that this was a genuine inquiry. It might be that somebody spoofed the person who made the inquiry. That is, it could have been a, 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 a prank true. or a troll or something like that. True. But in any event, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, so first of all, there's no chance that the Supreme Court's going to undo its decision no, based not. on that, right? Yeah. But also, I, I think that, I mean, I think the decision was wrong and terrible, but I don't think that's a basis for undoing it, given that the uh, the existence of any customers was not the basis for their uh, hearing the case in the first place. But, you know, this does go back to the idea of the appearance of impropriety, which used to be a standard. So you know, to put it in a more c- current vernacular, not a good look for the Supreme Court. Well, I certainly agree with that. And it's especially puzzling because presumably the reason they took this case was that they were eager to decide an issue they left undecided a few years ago. Listeners may recall the court had more or less the same issue before it in a case also from Colorado, this one involving a baker okay, who didn't right, want to right. bake a wedding cake for a uh, same-sex couple. That case was a little bit less hypothetical. There were actual customers who came Mm -hmm. into the the bake shop. But the court there did not resolve the free speech issue. They decided it on a kind of bogus uh, religious discrimination ground. But as a result, they left the free speech issue undecided. So you could imagine that the reason they took 303 Creative was because they were going to decide this case and thereby set a precedent. Except that the key question in the case is, who is the beneficiary of this free speech exemption from anti-discrimination law? Uh, Because it's not everybody. The court says it's only those who are engaged in what we might call sort of bespoke expressive business. And apparently creating websites is such a thing. Maybe baking a cake is, but the court doesn't define what is a uh, an expressive business? It says we don't have to decide that because there's a stipulation. The parties agreed here that this is an expressive business, and so they don't un- they don't resolve at all uh, mm-hmm. the most important question. And therefore, there's going to be now you know years and years of additional mm-hmm. litigation, right? So now we'll, next we'll have florists. Uh, then we'll have uh, we'll have bakers again. No, we won't what have about- florists. We'll have pretend florists. <laughs> uh, maybe bartenders. Bartenders can be very chatty. Well, and yeah. also, what about this? You know, going the other way, would this give someone who's operating a website the right to say, you know, you're MAGA? I don't want to work with you. Uh, I th- absolutely. Um, and the, now, the, of course. Uh, they can already do that in most jurisdictions because in um you know there is no in general public accommodations law protects against discrimination on the basis of particular statuses such as race sex national origin mm-hmm. sexual orientation etc cetera, etc cetera. um political identity is not generally one of those there are some states whose uh, mm-hmm. public accommodations laws are broader and they forbid uh, merchants and others from discriminating against people whose politics they don't like, but that's not true in most states. So it's already, even before this decision, in most states, already. if someone, yeah, if someone came into your, um, you know, your uh, ice cream shop wearing a MAGA hat, you could say, we don't, we don't serve uh, hmm. such people. Hmm. Um, now, it's not good business, of course, and so uh, I'm not sure that, that was happening a lot, but it was possible. It's it's possible. Well, we usually I usually have uh, Pam Rogers here, who's a staunch Republican with the other side, but I can really go wild on my on my more Democratic views today, which is freeing and enjoyable. 
there is discussion about what we do to fix this. There's a lot of discussion about expanding the Supreme Court. Um, personally, I'm agnostic. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure that's the way to go, but I think that there are legitimate questions involving uh, corruption of of some of our Supreme Court justices, and certainly uh, folks who lied during their confirmation hearings. Um, and to my to my mind, a very real possibility for valid grounds for impeachment, which we could do if Democrats controlled both branches of Congress, if they control, if they continue to control the White House. So that's my view. My view is, wouldn't it be better to get the justices who are um, not up to standards out? So uh, that seems to me politically impossible because you need a two thirds vote in the Senate to convict on impeachment. Well, and... two thirds Im impossible today, but not necessarily forever. Right. Although I do think that in a world in which Democrats have a two thirds majority of the Senate, yeah. there's a whole lot of other stuff you can also do um, that, you know, doesn't necessarily moot this. But but the, that world is so different from where we are now that I don't know what you know, where you would put Supreme Court reform or what kind of Supreme Court reform on that, uh, so, that agenda. So do you think that we need reforms in the Supreme Court? And do you think that those reforms include expanding it? So um, to expand the Supreme Court is a little easier, right? That that only requires um, le ordinary legislation. But of course, to get ordinary legislation through the Senate, you have to get past a filibuster, which also seems impossible. Mm -hmm. Or, and this you could do with a simple majority, you need to get rid of the filibuster. Um, so, so long as the Democratic majority in the Senate depends on wobbly Democrats like Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema and maybe others uh, who are unwilling to uh, change the cloture rule, which is what gives us the filibuster, then there's no realistic chance of passing legislation expanding the size of the Supreme Court. I should say, I... Um, my own views about court expansion, if you had the votes to do it, are somewhat ambivalent, mostly because I imagine that, you know, it's the opening move in a tit for tat long game that eventually leads Republicans to expand and eventually you've got thousands of members of the Supreme Court. Uh, right. So, so I, I mean, I think that our politics are broken. A lot of that has to do with stuff that's baked into the constitution, namely the overrepresentation of uh, rural states, um, but uh, and and constituencies within those states. Um, yeah. uh, but you know, politics can change in relatively short order. Um, and so I, I, yeah. I think that the place that I would want to put a lot of action is, on changing hearts and minds of ordinary people, and then maybe uh, stuff that looks politically impossible now could become politically possible. Yes, yes, I think so. I'd like to ask you just, just. Um, oh, it, it's. I'm sorry, I'm just totally blanking. I was going to ask you something, and I just blanked on it because my air conditioner okay. broke, and I'm, I'm melting. The, oh no, I know what it is. Okay, one more question. Sure. Given that we live in a country where about one in five people don't even know that we have three branches of government, what do you want folks to know about the judicial branch? Um, I guess the thing that I would emphasize is that they are just people, uh, that they have values and politics in the same way that everybody else does, that ideally they are not driven entirely by their values in politics, but that when they tell you that they are not driven at all by their values in politics, mm -hmm. they're at yeah. least lying to themselves and probably aware that they're uh, at, at best exaggerating. Excellent, excellent answer. Thank you so much for joining us, Michael Dorf. I encourage everybody to find his blog, Dorf on Law, and find his, his piece in the Boston Globe on July 5th. Thank you so much for joining us.
Thank you. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for joining us for Going to Spare It, Politics and Crime with Pam and Mara. Pam took a very well-deserved day off today, so it was my pleasure to speak with uh, law professor Michael Dorf today, and we hope that you'll join us next time. In the meantime, you can find us on all of your podcast platforms, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, wherever you want to see podcasts. That's where you'll find us. Subscribe and give us a five-star review. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care.